Hello folks and welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture we'll be covering the media-centered perspectives. It's the final perspective offered in the Cell Now book. Uh, and it's a, it's a really good one. A lot of people enjoy this. Uh, however, as we'll get into, it's probably best to think about combining this one with one of the other perspectives we talked about. A lot of people use this in conjunction with neo-Marxism or feminism, for example. Uh, but really, you, you could combine this uh, with any of those, or you could, you know, try to make uh, use it alone. Uh, but I think it'd probably be easier to blend it. So anyway, we'll be covering five things in this lecture. We'll talk about media ecology, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, media logic, commodification, amplification, and reduction. And then we'll get into some of these other media theories like social media or social learning theory, parasocial relationships, and cultivation theory. I know that some of this might sound a little bit abstract at the moment, but it's actually very applicable. And it's just kind of fun to, to think about these concepts. Uh, and then we'll also talk about how do you actually apply these, apply this terminology and these concepts when you want to write rhetorical analysis. So we'll get into that, of course. Uh, but for now, though, a question for you. Uh, so you might have heard this. This is a study from uh, Pew Research, who does a lot of studies of the media, media inf impact, the Internet, and so on and so forth. And they did one that was looking at how people get their news. So you probably know uh, there's not as many people reading newspapers uh, or listening to uh, radio news or even watching uh, television news programs. Uh, instead, they find that a lot of people, you know, look at 86%, so, you know, a pretty, uh, a pretty good uh, chunk. Let's see how do these numbers work off. I guess this is a percentage of U.S. adults who get news from blank often or sometimes. So it says here, I guess, 60% of their participants often get their news from digital devices. So that's how you're supposed to read this chart. A little bit uh, confusing, I suppose. But, you know, the takeaway there, I guess, is that um, 10 per, only 10% often get their news from newspapers, 16% uh, from radio, and so on. And so anyway, just look at that chart and think about what kind of impact do you think this might be having uh, on uh, society, on culture? That's a sort of big picture view. What difference does it make if people are getting news from a smartphone versus uh, reading about it in a newspaper? Does it make any difference? Uh, why or why not? <laughs> so ponder on that, and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so when you were thinking about that, you were, whether you realized it or not, thinking about media ecology theory. Kind of following the trajectory of this scholar here, Marshall McLuhan, who is probably most famous for his slogan, the medium is the message. And we can get into him. He's a really interesting scholar. Uh, he's kind of, <laughs> kind of wild, really. If you sit down and try to read his books, they're almost like poetry, uh, more than just standard you know, academic prose. Uh, but scholars have uh, gone into his work and culled out a few very useful concepts. And so you can see there how he, they define media ecology theory as how media and communication processes affect human perception, understanding, beliefs, and behaviors. Uh, so we got all this media in society, and this you go back in history, and it might be newspapers, and then it was the radio, and then it was television, and so on. And so for McLuhan, this is not just, a, this is an important thing. You know, moving from a print-based society to uh, television and beyond that, it makes a big difference. He talks about how it uh, affects the way we see things, how we, uh, what we believe is happening in the world. And he talks, he's got this concept that everybody likes called the global village. Now, I'll just say briefly, because we could talk for many, many hours about <laughs> Sean McLuhan. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he was uh, writing this stuff back in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, really. And there was a, a big concern back then about television making people dumb or making people lazy. Uh, when I was a kid, there was all the uh, this talk about couch potatoes. And they'd say, uh, don't be a couch potato. You know, you're just sitting at home, you're watching TV, it's just dumbing you down, you know, and so on and so forth. You need, you need to get out there and, uh, you know, it's kind of cutting you off and making you uh, kind of a hermit, really. Uh and so what uh, McLuhan was saying is don't be, you can't just say that television is doing that. You know, if in fact it's, <laughs> if in fact it's doing that. <laughs> you know, there's nothing about a TV show that, uh, there's nothing about a television uh, that makes it so that it has to be uh, an inferior product, let's say, or less sophisticated uh, than a novel or, you know, any of these older, more traditional forms. 
Uh, you could have a very sophisticated, very intelligent, very uh, thought-provoking movie or TV show, just like you could have a very stupid one. <laughs> you know, so you can't just lump the medium in there with the content and just uh, assume it's the same thing. So that that's probably just sounds like common sense to, to, to you because we kind of been influenced by McLuhan. Uh, but back when he was writing this, this was somewhat controversial, kind of hard for people to uh, to follow his, his thinking there. Um, uh, so that's one point. And then this other point here about, you know, the global village. You know, we, we're all, if we all watch, uh, say, the Super Bowl, we're talking about it the next day at work or whatever, uh, you can't really say that's, you know, isolating people and, and, and cutting them off, right? In a way, it's kind of... Uh, forming a common culture, right? A common society or a global village. Uh, in a way, I guess it's connecting us, not just cutting us off into like couch potatoes. Uh, okay, so media laws then. Uh, these are fun. This this was developed by McLuhan, but then I guess he, he died and it was just kind of in notes form. So I think his son came in and like organized it. Uh, but these are about what happens to media, kind of a cycle. So a new medium comes out, it could be, say, Spotify or uh, and what's some of the uh, the newer ones, uh, TikTok, <laughs> whatever the case may be, <laughs> Facebook, you know, something comes out, Twitter. And so then you can say, let me think about Twitter or think about uh, TikTok or uh, augmented reality or whatever. And then you could say, what does that medium enhance? Uh, what does it make obsolete? Uh, what does it retrieve from the past that had been made obsolete? before this and then what is uh this first one's kind of hard uh, but what does the medium reverse or flip into when pushed to extremes so again some of these are clearer than others but it's probably because uh, <laughs> well for one thing it's McLuhan uh and two it's that again these were notes compiled by his uh, his son but here's some examples from wikipedia that i think make it fairly clear uh, so with the enhancement what the medium amplifies or intensifies, for example, radio amplifies the news and music via sound. And then that makes a certain amount of sense, right? You have radio, now you can have audio. And so instead of just reading the news, you can have it read to you by a professional uh, commentator, basically. Of course, you don't have to think too hard to think about music. Now, uh, think about how many people could listen to a song on the radio uh, versus going to a concert hall, you know, hearing it that way. Uh, so that's the enhancement. Uh, the obsolescence, what does the medium drive out of prominence? So with radio, they say, you could say it uh, reduced the prominence of print and the visual, right? Why buy a newspaper, uh, you know, or uh, <laughs> I guess look at pictures <laughs> and when you could just listen to it on the radio. Uh, three, retrieval, uh, what the medium recovers, which was previously lost. Uh, so radio returns the spoken word to the forefront. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. You think about a society before uh, uh, the Gutenberg press or before uh, for the printing press, and you pretty much, if you want to hear something, you have to go to hear a public speaker. Uh, you know, think about a preacher reading a sermon. Uh, think about a, a professional uh, lecturer. You know, you, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> once you had newsprint, it's a lot easier. You can make a thousands and thousands of newspapers and just write the speech that way and have people read it. Uh, so it kind of um, made those public speakers a little less uh, relevant, I suppose. Uh, but radio, suddenly they're back, right? People need these again. And, you know, what I'm thinking of with this one, this example of the radio is kind of interesting because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, but you could say that it's kind of like retrieving some of what they were doing with radio. Like uh, back in the early days of radio, you had all these radio shows, uh, which would be sort of lengthy talk shows or they had plays and stories and basically movies in audio format <laughs> and so some of those are are back you know now that they're now that this podcasting technology exists so some of that stuff that was thought obsolete is back you know people are doing uh audio plays or, or whatever they call it podcast basically they're doing the, the podcast version of those old radio shows from uh, back in the day so that, that's kind of interesting that's retrieval uh, and then reversal what is it when it's pushed to its limits, uh, so they say acoustic radio flips into audio visual TV. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I've never been too clear on this last, <laughs> this last one. Uh, but the first three make a lot of, a lot of sense to me. All right, media logic. 
uh, focuses on the degree to which users tend to take the medium and its social uses for granted, and thus fail to realize how it influences us to or how it influences us to believe and behave about what is normal, good, desirable, and, and so forth. And so this is a book by David Althein and Robert Snook. And so they also talked about television a lot. How it was this this dominant medium, and I think the emphasis here is on how. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of inundated, saturated with these technologies, but a lot of us, we don't really think too much about what kind of impact that might be having. So that's really the question is to, instead of just sort of going along and not really being critical of anything and just kind of going with the flow, <laughs> you know, to really zero in and start paying attention to this. Like, what does it mean that I'm spending, you know, all these hours, some, some insane amount of time uh, staring at my uh, iPhone all day? You know, that, that sort of question. What is this bigger picture of you? How is this uh, affecting not just me, me as an individual, but society? Now, here's a question that's kind of fun. Uh, so consider how young people, maybe yourself, uh, listen to music these days compared to the days before the Internet. Uh, so do you think services like Pandora, iTunes, etc., is that just a matter of uh, convenience and it doesn't really have much impact beyond that? Or do you think it's in some way changed the role that music plays in society? So, you know, big impact. Uh, has it affected the way we live? Uh, so ponder on that and the implications of that for a little bit, and then we'll uh, move on. Okay, so uh, this is where it gets a little bit uh, more <laughs> applicable, I suppose. Uh, so one of the ideas behind uh, media theory is how you can make money with it, right? You know, they don't, since the day, early days, there's always been this idea that we need to somehow uh, make money with the programming. You know, this, this, you probably heard the word soap opera. Uh, why is it, you might wonder, why is it called soap opera? Well, it was because those shows were uh, promoted by, uh, or, uh, funded by soap manufacturers, right? Detergents, uh, dishwashing soap, <laughs> you know, you, you name it. Uh, so they would uh, pay for, to pay to put these uh, shows together. And then they would constantly talk about the soap <laughs> at the beginning. This show brought to you by, you know, the soap brand. And so they just kind of uh, started calling those uh, soap operas because of the connection to soap. And, of course, there's uh, television commercials. You know, nothing. I'm not telling you anything new here at all. Uh, but this is a little bit uh, of a more interesting thing. Uh, so instead of just talking about television commercials like obvious stuff, uh, the idea is you want to look a little closer and see is there more subtle ways uh, to put a marketing message into a movie, show, or game. Some, some people call it product placement. And so in The Walking Dead, you got this scene. I think it's, I don't remember what episode it is, but, but Glenn, you know, he takes off in this Dodge Challenger RT. <laughs> you know, and I realized, I looked up the car because I, I was curious what, you know, I thought it was a, a Mustang or something. I, I'd forgotten what car it was. And so I went back and looked at the clip again, and it's this, this Dodge Challenger RT. Now, I ended up with this very same car, <laughs> a different color, <laughs> a slightly different make. But anyway, the Dodge Ch Challenger RT, none the same, uh, all the same. So it kind of makes me wonder, maybe this worked on me. I didn't even realize it. I wasn't even conscious of it. You know, just like in The, the Walking Dead, and I remember this scene and you know how much fun Glenn was having. You know, and I, of course, I, like most people, identify a lot with Glenn. He's a good character. You, you like him. You want to be like him. And so I wonder if this kind of, uh, you know, influenced me to get this car eventually. You know, who knows? But, but that is an example. And, of course, car companies, you know, I'm sure Dodge, no telling how much they paid to have him in this particular car. You know, they make sure that you see, like, the, <laughs> the, the logo so you know what kind of car it is and very distinctive shape and so on and so forth. If it's a... Uh, Sometimes you'll watch a show and you'll notice that they'll have, say, a Ford, but they'll have, like, a black paint or sticker over the Ford logo because a Ford didn't pay. <laughs> you know, Ford, you have to pay if you want us to take that off and actually show your, your logo. So that's kind of interesting. And, of course, uh, you know, they, they make fun of this. And the uh, Truman Show, I think they mentioned that. A lot of, a lot of uh, movies will poke fun of this. Wayne's World. <laughs> You know, I remember them um, making fun of that as well. Uh, but it's often quite effective, you know, and they don't. Uh, sometimes they do ham it up a little bit too much. They make it a little bit too obvious. You know, if you're just constantly talking about the product. Uh, well, I really uh, enjoy using my iPhone. You know, I get paid a lot of money by Apple to talk about their iPhones. <laughs> just kidding. 
Uh, but that's the idea. Commodification. It's not just a commercial that interrupts a program. You know, it's, it's finding ways to like put the products into the shows uh, and selling them uh, that way. Uh, and then amplification and reduction is another rhetorical uh, means of uh, using media to influence people or trying to influence them. And so this is a pretty interesting idea. So amplification means you're sort of drawing people's attention. You're loudening that message, uh, whatever that is. You're sort of saturating uh, the news cycle with the story about X over Y or Z. So you just keep talking about this one topic over and over again, or you only show one thing in a certain connotation, or uh, it's basically just being repetitive. And when you're doing that, you're zero, when you focus in on one thing, of course, that means you have to pay less attention to other things, uh, which is the flip side of this. So you amplify one thing, and at the same time, you're amplifying that, but you're also reducing uh, all the other things uh, that you could be talking about. So a news, news show, you know, 60 minutes, they can only put so much stuff in the, into that 60 minutes, right? Uh, so you might uh, say, how much time do they dedicate to this topic as opposed to these other topics? And obviously a lot of stories that they could have put in there just won't get put in at all. Uh, you know, didn't have enough time, didn't think it was a, a priority. And so that's really the, the basic concept. And it applies, I think, pretty easily to news, but really you could, you could see this in all those other things. Remember when we talked about a, a fem, uh, feminism perspective, for example, and you talk about how if you if you got uh, shows where the female characters are always shown in a certain way, doing a certain thing, uh, that's amplifying that. And when you're doing that, you're also reducing, you know, the other types of shows where the characters would be doing, uh, you know, other jobs and you know, other professions. So it's, it's always kind of this double-edged uh, sword. And so here's just a quick example here uh, I was looking at. And they, they're saying that statistically... Uh, there's a lot fewer people dying in war, uh, according, I forget who compiled this, Our World in Data. Uh, so you can see this, a lot of people think, you know, especially when there's, there's a news story out there about a, a conflict somewhere, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, wars in places like Syria, Iraq, uh, they tend to uh, focus on, you see a lot of violence, you see a lot of uh, you know, the same footage over and over again. And it sort of in your mind becomes like this picture of, wow, there's a lot more people dying in war now than uh, in history. You know, don't I wish I lived back in, say, the 50s when there was a lot less, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot less war. Uh, but, you know, as this, this uh, chart shows you, really, you know, that would have been the wrong choice. And you know, really, you're better. You're safe. I guess it was a little bit safer there. Looks like about maybe 2003 or so or four. Uh, but still, just relatively speaking, you could see all these countries where there are just very few war deaths. Uh, but, you know, obviously there, it's not very exciting just to have news about, oh, here's another peaceful day here in St. Cloud, Minnesota. <laughs> oh, can't wait to tune into that, you know. Uh, you know, so they're going to show you if there's a little conflict. If, well, you know, it's not little wherever it is, right? But if, they, if they're always uh, talk, focusing on conflict somewhere, uh, that tends to uh, to skew uh your perspective on what, what's going on, right? And that's amplification and, and reduction. Okay, uh, this is uh, another theory, social learning theory. And I always like this one. To me, this one makes a lot of sense, and I like it too because it's based on science. <laughs> so there's like experiment, to, you know, real experiments to back it up, uh, scientific data. And it looks at live models and symbolic models. So it's a lot. You can see already how this is similar to those uh, models and anti-models. Uh, that we talked about in uh, uh, the narrative perspective, for example, or the feminism perspective. Uh, so what happens here, according to this theory, um, and it, this could be real life, too. Social learning theory is not just media. It, it could be, you know, you're watching your parents. Uh, but you're watching people, and it's, I guess the idea here is it's less about direct instruction. Uh, I was thinking about um, uh, watching uh, your parents do chores, let's say, uh, or the way they behave, the way they react in certain situations, right? So you, you got your kids there, they're watching you, <laughs> uh, and they're learning based on what you're doing. You know, they're, they're paying attention to you, they're modeling their behavior, especially based on the consequences that they observe. So this is, uh, I, I just know this one's true. I, I just feel like it in my gut. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and, you know, one of the ways they're or I guess my personal anecdote that uh, to me confirms this was I like to play darts. 
Uh, and I've never been, I've never been taking any classes in darts or even read a book on it or watched a video, nothing. Uh, but I noticed that when I'm somewhere and there are people there that I'm playing with who are really, really good, somehow, almost magically, I get better. You know, again, it's not a conscious thing. I'm not like looking at them closely, trying to imitate them, nothing like it. It's just, it's all subconscious, and I think it's this this thing playing out, right? It's just sort of, I mean, of course you're looking at them, you know, they're about to throw their dart, and you see, oh, they made a bullseye, oh, they made another bulls, you know, or, or whatever they're aiming at. And somehow this, you know, social learning kicks in, uh, you, and you're just sort of subconsciously, I guess, tiny little movements, I, I don't know what the, the, the thing is, it's, like, it's just like magic to me. <laughs> uh, but it really does seem to work. Uh, so this is why they tell you in uh, sports, you know, find a, Play with the good people, you know, don't, you know, don't just uh, choose people to play with that are brand new or that, that are crappy. <laughs> you know, you learn more, even if you get beaten badly uh, by these uh, people who really know what they're doing, you're going to learn a lot through this uh, social learning theory. Uh, so it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but the argument here is that it also plays out symbolically when you're watching some stuff on, on TV. Uh, or film. So the live is you know, they're, they're, you're there playing darts, this person there, it's live. Uh, symbolic might be I'm watching a, a show about darts or a movie where there's a, is there a dart movie? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm watching that dart movie. Uh, so it's similar uh, to the, uh, it works in a similar way to the uh, live model. Maybe not as effective, but uh, still having that impact. And again, we're imitating the behaviors of people we like. So Zach and Slate are there. And not wanting to be like uh, Screech, if you're familiar with Saved by the Bell. <laughs> All right, and then a parasocial relationship theory, another interesting one. Uh, so this is, yeah, you probably know people, or my, maybe you. You know, maybe you feel like you're good friends with a celebrity or a famous person. Now, you've never actually met this person. You haven't sat down and had coffee with them. You haven't had lunch with them. Uh, they're not related to them, you know, you, maybe you've never met them, never even seen them um, outside of a screen uh, or on social media. Maybe you follow them on Twitter, but you're like just one of like millions, you know. Uh, and yet, and yet, you know, you might feel like you know them, right? You, you, you feel like you have this bond of intimacy, uh, even though you don't really uh, know these people. And she talks in there about uh, uh, the show Friends, if you remember that one. And uh, she says, uh, I think this is probably true. If it's a realistic show or the characters are behaving in a realistic fashion, uh, that sort of makes this more powerful, this bond of in intimacy. You might feel like, uh, well, they must not be that different than their real life uh, counterparts, right, <laughs> on Friends. Or, or you're watching Friends and you're like, my friend's kind of like this. You know, that one, that's an interesting way to think because you, you wonder if, like, the show uh, also makes your friends you know, act a certain way because they're trying to be more like the show, but the show is trying to be more like, <laughs> you know, the real life, uh, you know, 20 somethings, I suppose. So it's kind of a feedback loop uh, to some extent. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, this is just the idea that, oh, yeah, I'm good friends uh, with uh, Mike Rowe is one of my, you know, favorite people. I, I like to watch him when he's on. I liked his A Dirty Job show. Uh, I like his, uh, he's got a Facebook thing and he's got a podcast. You know, so I listen to this stuff and and I really feel like I kind of know him, even though I'm sure he has no idea who I am. Never met him in real life, never shook hands, nothing like that. Uh, but yet, it feels like I do, and I think that's because he uh, he's very uh, good about bringing his family in. Like, so like he talks about his mom all the time, and his mom's book, and his dad. Uh, you know, and he, pictures like this. To me, this picture here doesn't look like this big movie star you know, big celebrity photo. I mean, to me, it just looks like a regular dude, <laughs> you know, hanging out with his uh, mom and dad on a couch. Uh, you know, it looks almost like I'm just kind of, I've gone to his house and th there's a picture of his, uh, you know, actually, I guess it's probably his parents' place. But you can see how this is kind of like showing me like the private world of him, of uh, Mike Rowe. And so they're using strategy. Now, I don't know if he sits down and like ponders parasocial relationship theory or whatever. Uh, but the result of it is, I think, and it's not just me. You know, I'm sure a lot of people who follow him probably feel like, yeah, I know Mike, I have a pretty good sense of who he is as a person. Uh, even though, again, it's only parasocial. Remember, para just means it's like something, but it's not the real thing. It's like paramilitary. You know, it's like a military, but it's not an actual military. 
And the same thing here with this parasocial, right? So it's like a social tie, but it's not really. Mainly because it's just one way. You know, I feel like I know a lot of stuff about him, but, he, <laughs> you know, I could pass him on the street. He wouldn't recognize me, obviously. Um, okay. Uh, cultivation theory. You know, this one's probably the most uh, controversial one. Um, but, you know, this is an idea behind a lot of uh, repetition on commercials. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, the idea is if you, you could watch a commercial once or see a message one time or play like one violent video game, and it's not going to have any impact. You know, just not here today, gone tomorrow, nobody cares. Um, uh, but what happens is these, these things accumulate. So just, you know, if you're day after day, you know, it's, it's, there's a big difference maybe in playing like, a, you know, a violent video game one time uh, versus playing it like every day for, you know, just some insane amount of hours. And so the idea is all of this stuff kind of, it's continual exposure and it's uh, accumulating more and more and more and more. Uh, and eventually it can, it can sort of start to blur the boundaries, I guess, between the, the real world and this, uh, you know, attitude about the world, I guess, that it's been. Uh, generated uh, by these, uh, you know, by the, uh, whatever this message is. Um, so, like, if you saw just movie after movie, show after show, and the and it was depicting something. Uh, oh, what's I'm trying to think of some of these myths from my TV. So, like, this is a recurring one about how uh, when you're arrested, you get this right to make a phone call. Right, I have a right to make a phone call. And, you know, the reality is a lot more complicated than that, apparently. You know, I don't <laughs> know about this from experience. <laughs> uh, but I remember reading that, you know, that's actually not a guaranteed thing. Uh, everybody thinks it is just because they've seen so many times on, on uh, movies, you know, and shows and things. Or like just what is, uh, what's it like to be in prison? You know, people see, oh, it's like Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> you know, they, they jump right to this sort of Hollywood uh, conception. You know, another one is, uh, what, what's it like being a lawyer, uh, being an attorney, right? And they think about, oh, it must be like uh, Matlock or something. Uh, so you see all these uh, messages, just, it's not just one show, but like all these different shows and movies and just constantly reinforcing this message. And it begins to shape, you know, how people think uh, the real thing is. You know, they might be in for a rude awakening uh, when they find this. But, you know, the reason I said it's kind of controversial is because everybody... You know, I get sick to death of reading these essays about uh, violent video games, right? And they say, the kids are playing these violent video games and that causes real life violence. Uh, I mean, first of all, no, there's no such thing. You can't say it causes it. it, it you know, like, that's a very strong, you wouldn't see that in any kind of legitimate scientific study because uh, we don't know. I mean, there's many other factors at play. Uh, to say that this, this one thing causes anything is problematic. You know, even a commercial... Even like marketers, they don't say that, you know, if you will just uh, buy a commercial from us, we will cause you to have better sales. <laughs> they, they wouldn't say that because they get sued. Uh, there's no way they can, no matter how good the commercial is, right, it's not going, there's no guarantees that it's going to work because there's all these other uh, factors in place. I mean, you know, the best you can say is maybe it influences, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. <laughs> you know, you can say uh, indirect things. Uh, but it's really, really hard to say it's a cause and effect uh, relationship. You know, not just with the, the violent video games, but, but, but any of this stuff. Uh, so that's, that's one of the problems. And, you know, the, whenever they do this violent video games thing in the studies, it's always, you know, you can find one study that says it maybe it does uh, increase uh, aggression or something. And then another study says it actually it doesn't. Uh, and then they'll start fussing about, well, what do you even mean by aggressive behavior? You know, how do you measure that? And so it's basically just uh, inconclusive, but it's another one of those things where people tend to jump the gun uh, and assume there's a causal uh, uh, relationship there. Okay, so uh, how do you actually do a media-centered perspective then? Well, as I said at the start of the lecture, you probably want to mix this with something else. Uh, Neo-Marxism, for example, would make sense if you're talking about, say, commodities and like uh, product placement and things. Uh, you have a show that makes it look really great that you're driving this Dodge Challenger <laughs> around. <laughs> you know, you could tie that into pretty easily into an economic metaphor, right, from a neo-Marxist. Um, or feminism. You know, we, there's plenty of uh, examples of this. We talked about the uh, 
I remember talking in the feminism chapter, the, maybe in the visual perspective as well, like all those magazines with the scantily clad uh, cover models on those. And you could say that's kind of, we, we could bring that back to this cumulative theory or those uh, symbolic models again. Because this modeling the behavior, we're kind of saturated with these images. You know, maybe it was just one magazine uh, doing that. That'd be one thing. Uh, but the fact that it's across this whole spectrum of magazines, you know, maybe that uh, is having an impact. Uh, and then two, find an artifact in which the medium seems to play an important role. You know, I think that's a key uh, to this, especially if it's something new and kind of interesting. Like uh, they talked a little bit in here about Pokemon Go. You know, that's augmented reality. Kind of makes it a, you know, you're out in the real world seeing things on your phone. Uh, that's kind of new. That's kind of interesting. Uh, so if you wanted to talk about that, uh, this media perspective would be really good because you could get into like what makes this medium of augmented reality special. What kind of impact is that having aside from the actual content of the game? Uh, same thing with virtual reality. Uh, but, you know, things like, uh, well, I just was watching a, uh, I think, I think it was, I don't know if it's, I think it's Netflix maybe, Netflix or Amazon. Uh, but they had Bear Grylls, who's one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> favorite, uh, what do you call them, producers, performers, presenters, I don't know. Uh, but he had a, one of these sort of uh, man versus wild style shows. But this one was different because every now and then he would say, okay, if you want me to go over here and, you know, eat this, <laughs> eat this drink from this fetid river, or, or go over here and eat, try to drain water from this rhino dung, you know, you can press A or B on your controller. Uh, on your remote control. So it was like tied into your, uh, into Netflix somehow. So it was interactive. And it, let, it lets you make a choice. Uh, so it's, to me, that's kind of interesting from a media perspective because it kind of makes you wonder, like, what about that's kind of neat that you can make make this choice? How does that uh, affect the other elements? You know, I could imagine uh, saying maybe it affects the narrative because now it's kind of making me uh, responsible in some ways for telling the story. Now, or you could say... Um, you can go back to that symbolic model and talk about how you can see the results of what happens. You know, if I give Bear Grylls the wrong, if I make the bad decision and he gets into trouble, then I, you know, sort of feel like that. <laughs> you know, I see like both sides. So I see the, the good consequence of the right decision. I see the negative consequences of the bad decision. And so maybe I could say that um, is really effective, more effective in terms of that social learning theory. You know, you, you play around, who knows? Uh, and then three, of course, uh, what are the potential implications of all this? You know, big picture, the so what question. Uh, so, so who cares, you know, about the uh, being able to tell Bear, Bear Grylls to do this as opposed to that? <laughs> you know, what difference does it make? Uh, so what you want to do is kind of step, take a step back, look at the big picture and say, well, if everybody considered these consequences of this, uh, you know, technology, this media, uh, what might the impact be? You know, what, what might... You did this at the start of the uh, lecture, right? Now, what if 100% of people got their news from their, their phone? You know, like nobody was looking at newspapers or TV anymore. <laughs> what might the consequences of that be? Uh, I mean, for one, there'd be a lot of companies going out of business, but uh, it could have uh, other things, other considerations. Maybe maybe we haven't even thought about. Uh, so anyway, uh, have some fun with this question. Oh, how did I? Oh, <laughs> oh whew, okay. Getting a little too excited. All right, question three then. So we'll uh, wrap up here. Uh, so there's an essay in the back of the book about Harry Potter. And uh, there's some questions about the... So read the essay first. You know, then come back and answer these questions. So how are realism and intimacy used to make the story believable and compelling? Do you agree? Why or why not? What influence, if any, might the Harry Potter attraction at Universal Studios have on embellishing Holly's argument? And finally, do you think the story and her analysis provide valuable insight into how we believe and behave today? Why or why not? All right, so we'll wrap it up there. Uh, as always, I'd love to hear your comments, questions. So make a comment or ask a question. Let me know what you think about all this stuff. Uh, you know, always love to read those. And we'll stop it here. <laughs> I'll see you next time.